The AWS Well-Architected Framework contains six principles that help you apply best practices while building cloud applications. These are extremely important principles that I think more people need to know about when they're designing, maintaining, and building their applications. And so in this video, I want to give a brief overview of the six different pillars. I'm also gonna give some commentary on them as well from my personal experience. Now we're not gonna talk about all the ideas from each pillar, but I'll leave a link to this application here, this mind map, which we're gonna run through. And it does have some links where you can access the different home pages for each of the pillars so that you can learn more. So Let's just jump right into it. We're going to talk about the first pillar, which is in terms of operational excellence. And operational excellence is the idea of running, monitoring, and continuously improving your application. So there's a couple different sub buckets that I like to talk about here. The first is in terms of operations as code. So anytime you're making any infrastructure update or any application configuration update, it should never be done manually. You should never be going to the AWS console and making these manual changes. It should always be done via a code process. So if you're doing infrastructure deployments, then you should be using infrastructure as code, using CloudFormation or Cloud Development Kit, for example. And if you're making configuration changes, you should be using a service like Parameter Store or AWS App Config as an option. We have all these tools available to us these days. We should never be doing anything manually. This is in terms of reducing the likelihood of fat fingering something or accidentally making a mistake. And it is an opportunity to make improvement to ensure that no mistakes happen when it comes to making these types of changes. The second is that we should strive to make frequent, small, reversible changes for our applications. This kind of relies on the fact that you have a robust deployment pipeline, such as a CI and CD pipeline, or a continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline that has unit integration and functional tests that are built in. You should strive to be able to make small, tiny changes that are related to a feature and then guard them behind a feature flag so that you can hide them from users if you desire to. And you should always strive to make reversible changes. So if something does get introduced that does cause some kind of side effect or undesirable problem, problem, you should have the ability to reverse that change and not adversely affect any of your clients or the application state itself. This is easier said than done and does sometimes require some careful thought and the way that we roll out changes, especially things like database schema updates or parameter changes to our APIs. It's always a better idea to add a new parameter or add a new field to your API instead of modifying the intent or modifying the format of an existing one, which can surely break some of your clients. The next one is in terms of anticipating failure. I think this is an extremely important kind of idea that most people need to spend a little bit more time thinking about. There's nothing worse than being on a high severity call where many of your customers are affected due to your application being down. Now, obviously there's many cases that we can't predict the way our application will fail, such as certain dependencies acting in a very bizarre way, but it's important to walk through the exercise of asking yourself, how would my application behave if this service went down or that dependency went down? What would the application state be? How would it be working? And what would I do to mitigate it if I were in that scenario? It's a lot easier to do this offline when you're not in a high severity situation. And I think this is something that most people don't really think about that they should spend more time on. This simple exercise can put you in a better position if these types of scenarios were to occur. So of course, this applies to known unknowns. So things that you can anticipate. There's also a second class of problems which are unknown unknowns, which are problems that you can't anticipate or applications responding or acting in a flaky way that you never would have imagined. You can't really predict these types of scenarios and the only thing you can do is try to be as well prepared as you can and be able to stay calm under pressure to resolve them for your customers. The next one is in terms of learning from all of your mistakes. Again, this is a really, really important one. We should never be making the same mistake twice and we should put processes in place so that we can learn from what happened and what went wrong so we don't do it again. Now at Amazon, they have a really effective way of learning from mistakes through a process called the COE or a correction of error document. This is a publicly known fact that Amazon uses this type of uh, correction when we have these types of high severity or high customer impacting events. And some 
some people see having to write these documents as kind of a penalty for making a mistake, and I completely disagree with this. I think that COE documents are extremely, extremely important. They're essentially a comprehensive document that lays out the timeline of the event, does an analysis of that event in terms of exactly what happened, why it happened, and then lays out a series of action items that could be related to the particular service that failed and also dependencies that failed in order to correct the mistake so that it never happens again. These are a super interesting thing to read, even if you're just an outside observer and you know nothing about the service that actually failed. I learn a lot from just reading other team COE documents. And I do think from an organizational perspective, they are an excellent way to make sure that all those involved in a outage can take corrective action to mitigate these types of issues going forward. It's not a problem to make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes and it's completely normal. It is a problem to make a mistake and not learn from it and make the same mistake again. So use these types of processes. You can, you can search for COE or correction of error documents, and I'm sure you can find some pretty good outlines for you to apply in your business. Okay, let's move on to the second pillar now, which is in terms of performance efficiency. So we don't wanna be wasteful here. We don't wanna be using services and renting machines and not be using them effectively. So this is all about being efficient with the hardware that we provision and the services that we use. So in terms of the ideas that I'd like to talk about here, the first one is to pick the right tool for the job. I feel that any organization should allow engineers or any developers or architects the ability to pick the right technology that is suitable for their use case. Of course, this is assuming that there's no licensing or any other issues like that, but if it makes sense to use a particular technology for a particular team, then the organization shouldn't block them. We should ensure that we're always picking the right solution for the type of use case that we have and not blocking our teams based on some political or other agenda. The next one is in terms of using serverless. I put a star beside this one because it's kind of subjective and I do kind of disagree with this as just a black and white principle to follow. Combining this idea with the one up here, picking the right tool for the job, I think you should strive to use serverless when it makes sense. You shouldn't just blindly use serverless. Uh, for those of you that don't know what serverless, it's basically just abstracting away infrastructure for you or just-in-time computing or just-in-time databases essentially is the idea. But um, kind of combining it with this principle, you shouldn't just blindly walk into it. You should use it when it makes sense. It's good at certain things, not good at others. The advantage of using serverless is that you don't need to worry about efficiency. All of that stuff is managed for you, which is why I suspect that they are pushing for it in the performance efficiency uh, pillar of the well-architected framework. Uh, the next one is to go global in minutes. And this one refers to being able to deploy your application to new regions, new ecosystems fairly quickly without having to do many manual changes. Now, if your application is built using infrastructure as code, using CDK or Terraform or CloudFormation or anything like that, this becomes trivial. But if you're doing everything manually, this becomes a very large issue. So in summary, you should try to strive for using infrastructure as code since adding a extra stack or an extra region for your application becomes a trivial process. It's just a simple config update where you push it and you basically go and everything is up to date in the new region. So that is a goal that you should strive for. Okay, let's move on to the next pillar now, which is in terms of reliability. Uh, so all of application building is for nothing if we can't ensure their application remains stable and reliable for our customers to use it. And that's what this pillar is all about. So there's a couple concepts to talk about here. The first one is automatic failure recovery. Now this refers to the idea that if we take a service like EC2, for example, where if a service or if a machine goes down, it's automatically detected and automatically replaced with a new machine. This idea of automatic failure recovery is built into many different AWS services. It should also be built into your specific application. So if a dependency goes down or something that you rely on goes down, and once it comes back up, your application should be working as expected without any type of manual action from yourself. This is something that you should strive for. If you're using AWS services predominantly, then this is kind of baked into the cake, so you don't really need to think about this. But if you're hosting any infrastructure on-premise or using a dependency that doesn't have automatic failure recovery kind of baked into how they build their applications, then this may be a concern. Also evaluate how your application will tolerate these types of failures and what, how it recovers. So if your application goes down due to dependency failure, 
when that dependency failure resolves itself, will your application just resume working or is there going to be some manual actions that you need to do? If there are manual actions, then you should try to automate that because applications are expected to fail and you can't be expected to always be performing these manual actions in these types of scenarios. The next one is in terms of scaling horizontally, which is the idea where we can add additional computing power by adding more instances as opposed to building or kind of upgrading our instance to a larger size. So for example, for vertical scaling is when if you have a database instance, a single database instance, and you now have a larger workload, so you'll make a larger database instance by adding more RAM, more CPU, more processors, more network throughput. There's only so high that you can go until this becomes cost cost prohibitive. Whereas if you're using horizontal scaling as a kind of concept or a principle that's built into your application, then you can just simply add smaller machines in more volume. And this makes it much more cost effective for you to support additional workloads for your application. The next is in terms of guessing your capacity or correctly allocating or right sizing your capacity. I always suggest to folks to start small with their instance types and then upgrade if they need to. However, there are a bunch of tools these days that help you make this a little bit easier easier. Um, so there's cost optimization tools for AWS Lambda and EC2 that can suggest the right type of instance or right type of memory settings for your Lambda after observing your application behavior for a period of time. You should use these types of services because they're essentially giving you money for free by suggesting to you a better configuration that right sizes your usage. Um, you should also go through a manual exercise to think through what is the bottleneck of your application. Do you get bottlenecked by CPU, by by memory, by network throughput, by something else. That's also a useful exercise to go through to help you pick the right instance types if you're using those types of options on AWS. Okay, so that's it for reliability. Let's move on to the next pillar here, which is in terms of cost optimization. If you're working for any business, obviously money is a concern. So we want to use our money wisely and not just be burning it in a fire. So in terms of the ideas to talk about here, the first one is to have cloud financial management. So you do need someone that's actually looking at this stuff. You need someone that's being aware of costs and being accountable to it. That's what this one refers to here. So just have some kind of financial controller that's keeping an eye on your bills. I also suggest giving the billing access to your engineers themselves so that they can specifically see where the different costs are going for their AWS services or their applications that rely on AWS. Uh, it's always interesting, at least for me personally, to see when I sign in to a certain application's AWS account to see how much it's spending on different AWS services. And it also helps me hold myself accountable. If I see that I'm spending X amount of money per month on some service, I'll say to my team like, hey, we should probably fix this. If you kind of create a process where the engineers are decoupled from the financial process, then there's no sense of accountability. So I do suggest using an approach where your lower level employees or your developers or higher level folks, even as developers, get access to this type of information so that they can stay accountable and own their application in terms of its cost. The next idea is in terms of measuring your efficiency. So in many AWS services, you have a concept of efficiency. This can be in terms of like CPU utilization on your infrastructure, could be in terms of memory utilization, disk space. There's a whole bunch of different ways that you can measure this. But essentially, you want to be keeping your utilization or your efficiency number somewhere between 50 and 80 percent. Um, you don't want to be having an application where it's only using like 10 percent of your CPU, for example. That means 90 percent of your cost that's going towards that infrastructure is complete waste. You should be aiming for something like 50 to 80 where, you know, you're, you're using it pretty well or more than 50 percent and you also have some headroom to grow so that you can set up alarms to notify you if you're ever going above 80 percent and then upgrade your instance types if need be. But keep an eye on the different utilization metrics. This depends depends on the service that you are using, but you should always strive for something between 50 and 80% in my opinion. And the last one is to analyze and attribute expenditures. So this is the idea that we should be paying attention to what we're spending our money on and be able to associate that money spent with particular projects or particular applications that we're running on the cloud. The easiest way to do this, in my opinion, is, well, there's two ways. The simplest is to use the tagging system. A much better way, especially if your organization starts to grow, is to use dedicated AWS accounts that are delegated or created through the AWS 
AWS organization service. And you should just create different AWS accounts that are for specific use cases, for specific applications. And this becomes much more easier to manage. It also has some better um, kind of side effects too. So you have more security, you have different AWS accounts, so things don't get mixed together. And the great side effect is that now you can track costs for particular applications independently from one another. Now, this may not be worth it if you're in a small organization, but if you're in a medium organization or a growing organization, you're going to want to use the separate AWS account approach. Okay, that's it for cost optimization. Let's move on to the next pillar here, which is in terms of sustainability. This is a relatively new pillar, and it is in terms of being more sustainable, both in terms of cost and the environment. So in terms of the ideas that I think are worth talking about here, some of this is repetitive from the previous because it is quite related to cost optimization. So aspire for maximum utilization. We already kind of talked about this. I don't think that it's worthwhile repeating, but you know, always be using between 50 and 80 percent of your provisioned infrastructure or just use serverless, which does all this for you. Second is to adopt more efficient hardware. So Graviton instances are a good example here. They have a much smaller uh, environmental footprint. They use less power and they're more powerful as well. So you should adopt uh, Graviton instances when it makes sense to do so, unless you have some kind of dependency that requires you to use these Intel CPUs. The last one is to use managed services, which do all of this stuff for you. So they make it so that you don't have to actually think about anything and all of the management in terms of utilization and efficiency is just handled for you out of the box. So these are the key ideas in terms of sustainability. Let's move on now to our final pillar, which is in terms of security. Of course, we need to have the right levels of authentication and authorization to our applications. And this is what security is all about. So the first one is to use a foundational identity provider or an identity service. Um, you can strive to use a single sign-on provider as well, but the key idea here is to pick one identity provider and then weave it into your organization. Um, so most people, when they think of identity providers, they think about like authorization to specific web pages or tools or things within the organization, but this can also apply for an application to application perspective. So applications themselves should have authorization, should have a contract concept of identity so that they are only allowed to talk to other applications when they've gone through the right security protocols. This ensures that all their dependencies are accounted for and the types of use cases that their service is providing to their customers is accounted for and also helps them from a peak scaling perspective. If you're just kind of in a, a cage match scenario or just a general arena where all of your applications within a organization have permissions to call each other with no permissions, no accountability, then it's just kind of a free for all and you're not gonna know how much you need to scale or how much you need to prepare in order to scale for peak events. So build a and use a foundational identity both in terms of the individuals and also from an application to application perspective. The next one is to have security at all layers which ties closely with the final one here which is encryption in transit and at rest. So you should have security that is applied and multiple layers in your application, both from the networking perspective, all the way up to the actual application level, and then from application to application behaviors as well. And you should also be using encryption when it makes sense to do so, both for in transit and at rest. Uh, we've all heard about the data leaks of different companies storing passwords or sensitive data in plain text. Don't be those types of people and don't make yourself vulnerable to men in the middle attacks by not using encryption. Uh, so this is something that I think is so easy to do these days using KMS or Keymaster service uh, from AWS. So you should always be using encryption both in transit and at rest. So these are the six different pillars. So we had security, sustainability, cost optimization, reliability, performance efficiency, and operational excellence. These are all hyperlinks and I'll leave a link to this tool down below in the description section of this video so you can check this coggle or this mind map out. And thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and please don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.